Christmas Eve is a different kind of a, a service. It's a different time. But the presence of God is so rich and so beautiful. And as Pastor Matt said, some of those old Christmas carols, they are chock full of all kinds of Bible theology. And uh, there's a strength and a power in them that we don't hear much uh, throughout the year. But I'm glad we get to sing them at Christmas time. I want to go to a scripture that's very familiar to those of us that read and celebrate the Christmas story every year in church. It's from an Old Testament prophet named Micah. And Micah wrote these words uh, in his prophecy hundreds of years before the events that we now call Christmas. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, though you're just a, a little town, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Micah and other prophets, they pointed to Bethlehem. They pointed to a little town. They pointed to a child that would be born. Isaiah had much to say about that. They pointed to a strange series of events that culminated in what we now celebrate as Christmas Eve. The night that the skies lit up with angels talking to shepherds and sending them on a mission to find the Christ child. And now we celebrate that, and I'm glad that we do. Every year in our world, at Christmas time, the world literally comes to Bethlehem. The rooftop of Bethlehem City Hall is always packed with camera crews from around the globe to capture a towering tree in Manger Square. And bells toll in Bethlehem every Christmas Eve for a midnight Catholic Mass at the Church of the Nativity. They say that is built on the grotto, on the cave, where according to tradition, Jesus was born. But this year in Bethlehem, there will be no Christmas tree in the town. There will be no parades or bands. There will be no music, no market, no feasts. No lights, no pilgrims or tourists, no Santas handing out candy to kids, and there will be no Christmas carols in Bethlehem this year because the world is in turmoil as we sit here in such comfort and cheer and hope in the province of New Brunswick and the city of Fredericton. The lyrics of an old Christmas carol written by Phillips Brooks in 1868 he wrote them after his own trip to Bethlehem, and there the lyrics are beautiful, but somehow they ring a little bit hollow this year. The beautiful words now, when you look at the news, seem to be filled with irony, almost a parody, as if they are mocking our world as it exists in 2023. Phillips Brooks wrote, O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. O Bethlehem, how still, how peaceful, how quiet, how silent. But the problem is that our world isn't still this Christmas Eve. Everywhere there seems to be fear and anxiety you look at the news and there's hatred and strife and there's darkness and hopelessness. Nations have declared themselves mortal enemies and multitudes have died in conflicts in recent weeks and months. You can feel a palpable tension in the media, in the shops, in the streets. Innocent people have become casualties of the conflicts that are raging in our world and Racism and terrorism are rampant and hatred seems to be the order of the day in so many places. And the crime and the fighting, it seems like it just never stops and despair is everywhere. And so in Bethlehem, the real Bethlehem, this Christmas Eve, it's especially somber and sad. It's strange in Bethlehem this year. There has been war in the air since the surprise attack that Hamas launched on unsuspecting Israeli communities 
back on October the 7th. 1,200 people were killed and 240 or more were taken hostage and that triggered all the current hostilities. And then the Israel Defense Forces, they've been fighting to eradicate Hamas and they've now killed more than 20,000 people in Gaza. And that's why this year in Bethlehem, Reverend Munther Isaac, who's pastor of the Evangelical Lutheran Christmas Church, he created a very different nativity scene for 2023. The baby Jesus is portrayed laying among flickering candles atop a pile of busted cement and dirty stone and ugly debris. And the message is clear. As Pastor Isaac stated just this week, this is what Christmas looks like in Palestine. If Jesus were born today, he would be born in a war zone like Gaza amid the rubble. Who can sing joy to the world today? But I would like to mention tonight that there is a final verse to Phillips Brooks' famous Christmas carol. And the promise of its lyrics transcend, whether it's peacetime or wartime or good times or bad times. And these lyrics bring us tonight to the real meaning of the Christmas story. Phillips Brooks wrote, O holy child of Bethlehem, <clears throat> descend to us, we pray. <clears throat> Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord, Emmanuel. And in that last word of that last verse of that old Christmas carol, that's the hope of the gospel and the true meaning of Christmas. You see, tonight we are not just rejoicing because of a baby born in a manger. It is far more than that. We are rejoicing because God himself came to our troubled world on that first Christmas night. God became flesh like us. The eternal one humbled himself to become human. The omnipotent one who had made us in his image, he now took upon himself our reality. He who was larger than the universe, he became a tiny embryo. He who sustains this world with his word chose to nourish himself through the womb of a virgin. That, brothers and sisters, that, ladies and gentlemen, is Christmas. Matthew 1 and 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son. And here it is, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted, the meaning of that beautiful word, that beautiful name is God with us. That is the point of Christmas. It's not the gifts and the wonderful celebrations. We love every minute. We cherish times together with family and friends. We cherish getting together and making memories and singing songs and going through holiday rituals, and that's all wonderful. But that's not the real core heart meaning of Christmas. The meaning behind all of our togetherness is his togetherness with us. God came to be with us. That's Christmas. And I'm so grateful for that in my life and in my family and in this church family and in the heart of every believer around the world. Emmanuel, God with us. My, my, my. That is the point of Christmas. He didn't come as an unapproachable conqueror. He came as one whose first cries were heard by a peasant girl and a sleepy carpenter. The hands that first cared for him, they were unmanicured and calloused and dirty. Were it not for the shepherds who came from the fields, there would have been no reception for the Christ child whatsoever on that first Christmas night. And still, he came 
to be with us. He came because the world, because his world, because our world was dark and sad and weary. And because he knew that only he could bring us lasting peace and joy and love. He came to this earth to become God with us so we could know and recognize his presence and so that one day we can all go to heaven and experience the presence of God with us for all eternity. Isn't that beautiful? That's Christmas, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> for 33 years, he would feel and know everything that you and I have ever felt. His body, like ours, would grow weak and weary. His head ached and his feelings got hurt. He walked dirt roads until his mud-stained feet were swollen. And he wept at the grave of a friend until his tear-stained eyes were swollen too. He came to be with us. He was ridiculed and he was rejected. He was victimized and vilified. And still, he came here to be with us. He came to a world that knew him not. He came to a nation that received him not. And he came to a people that loved him not. But in Bethlehem, as wonderful as that was and as beautiful as that is, and how meaningful it is as we sing about it tonight, in Bethlehem, his great condescension, his great humiliation, if you will, it was only beginning. Because you see, the shadow of a cross hung over that manger. Only when you understand that reality do you really understand Christmas. He didn't come to be celebrated. He didn't come so his deeds could be trumpeted. He didn't come so he could amass a great following who would hang on his every word. He came to offer his life for us, to save us from sin. Only when you get that do you really get Christmas because before it was over, that baby in a manger would grow up and he would be stripped of every shred of dignity. He would be pierced with a spear, nailed to a cross, crowned with thorns, beaten with whips, buried in a tomb. And then I'm glad to announce even on Christmas Eve, that in the 33rd year of his life, on the third day after he died, Jesus did the impossible to make salvation possible for you and I. He rose from the dead. And that too is the real meaning of Christmas because that's why he came, God with us. Scripture calls Jesus the son of David because he was a descendant of King David. And this was how the prophets spoke when they wanted to identify the Messiah, the son of David. And you see this in the Gospels, the four accounts that tell us of Jesus' life and ministry. When people wanted to reach out to Jesus for mercy or healing or deliverance, they would often cry using this title, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Because they believed they got it, they knew, they understood, they recognized that he was their long-awaited deliverer. He was their long-awaited Messiah. And then in John's end-time vision, it's called the book of Revelation, it's the last book in your Bible. Jesus says of himself, I am the root and the offspring of David. In other words, he's saying, I'm David's uh, ancestor and I'm David's descendant. I was born as a baby into David's family, but before David ever took up a sling or before David ever wore a crown, I was there because I'm God who came to be with my creation. I'm the root and the offspring of David. And Jesus is connected to David for another reason because they both, David and Jesus, even though they lived a thousand years apart, they were both born in that tiny little town of Bethlehem that we sing about every Christmas Eve. It was there that David grew up to become Israel's beloved king. It was there that David tended his father's sheep in its fields. And it was there in that town 
that he would write his majestic songs. He'd write by the rivers and the mountains and in the fields and the valleys as he tended sheep. And of all the psalms David would ever write, one would rise above them all. One would become more memorable than all the rest. One would become some of the most often quoted scriptural words in the history of the human family. And in David's honor, we even call it the shepherd's song. You know it. You can quote it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How many have ever heard or quoted those words? Would you lift your hand? Look at that. David wrote that 3,000 years ago, 1,000 years before Jesus walked this earth. Now, I'm no scholar, but every once in a while, pastors, they get a sudden inspiration about certain passages of the word of God. And this one came to me in the middle of the night. Um, I got up, and um, none of your business why I got up, but anyway, I got up. Don't look at me like that. Most of you did the same thing last night. <laughs> and because pastors are such spiritual men of God, I did what many pastors do when they get up in the middle of the night. I checked social media. <laughs> <clears throat> and somebody on Instagram had put this, and I looked it up because I don't trust Instagram, unlike some people. But I looked it up, and it's true. It's really amazing. That psalm right there, in the Hebrew language, there are 55 words in the 23rd psalm. 26 of those words lead up to a middle phrase, and 26 of those words follow after that middle phrase. And so 26 and 26, for all of you math graduates, that's 52. That leaves three words. And sure enough... That psalm is centered on one phrase that in Hebrew is three words, ki ata imadi, and it is translated into five words in English. It is the center phrase of the most famous psalm that David ever wrote. It's beautiful, and right in the dead center of Psalm 23 are these words, for thou art with me. That phrase is the heart of David's song. Before that phrase, you notice, God is addressed in the third person. He maketh me. He leadeth me. He restoreth me. But after that phrase, God is addressed in the first person. Thy rod and thy staff. Thou preparest a table. Thou anointest my head. Everything changes in Psalm 23 when David comes to that moment and he discovers, thou art with me. God is with us. David's point is clear on Christmas Eve 2023 when there's a lot of turmoil and tension in our world and perhaps there's some turmoil and tension in your life or in your family. Whether you're enjoying a green pasture or whether you're enduring a dark valley, God is with you tonight. Whether you're beside still waters or whether you're walking in the presence of your enemies, God is with you tonight. Like the very last verse of Psalm 23 says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That word follow in Hebrew is redaf, 
And radoff doesn't mean like a puppy dog wandering around following you. No, it means chasing something down, like a hunter would chase down a prey. God's mercy and his goodness literally chase us down every day of our lives. Surely goodness and mercy will chase me down every day of my life. And because of that, I just know this is a good place to be. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God never leaves us. God never gives up on us. His goodness and his mercy chase us down. Why? Because that's why he came. God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Ryan, come on back and just play softly if you would. It's been a different year for Beverly and I this year. Uh, Many of our church family would know that uh, Beverly had a little adventure with her health this year. Very serious situation. And uh, we've been dealing with that for about 11 months now, a little bit more. And this church has been so faithful and friends around the world have been so faithful to pray. We have never been so grateful for our wonderful medical professionals and doctors and nurses and specialists and surgeons. And we've never been more grateful. But can I tell you, we have never been more grateful for the faithfulness of God and the faithfulness of his people. And although it's been a year that Maybe like your year, we wouldn't choose to repeat it. We're glad we went through it. We're not glad because of the diagnosis or the treatments or the surgeries or the recovery. It's like so many things. We're just glad to be through that. But I can testify this and Beverly could testify this. Every day every moment every anxious moment can I testify to you God was with us and can I tell you that no matter what you or your family are going through God is with you he's not with you because a preacher stood behind a pulpit on a Christmas Eve night and told you God is with you that's not why he's with you he's with you because he said he would be with you He's with you because he came here to this earth and the whole purpose for which he came was to be with you. God is with us. I am so grateful for that. Years after David, even several years after Jesus walked this earth, one of his followers picked up a pen and wrote these words in the book of Hebrews. Let your conversation." Let your lifestyle, let the way you interact with the world around you, let it be without covetousness. Let it be without that clamoring and grabbing and greediness that we see in the world. It's a pretty good scripture for Christmas. And be content with such things as you have. I hope you get your favorite gift. I hope you get the fifth upgrade of the thing that you didn't need in the first place. I hope you get whatever your little heart desires. But can I tell you, that's not going to make your Christmas. Before we get to next Christmas, you'll want something else and you'll have forgotten that. That's why the word says, and be content with such things as you have. And here's why we're content. It's not because we're the wealthiest or the smartest or the greatest people in the world. It's because of this. For God has said, here's why we're happy. Here's why we love him. Here's why... We're so grateful to be serving him because he has said, Emmanuel has said, God with us has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. No matter where you go or where you've been, no matter what you've done or what you do, you cannot shake the fact that his goodness and his mercy are chasing you down all the days of your life. That's not just for pastors. That's not just for church people. That's for anybody and everybody. God's mercy and his goodness are looking for you because his goodness and his mercy, he's got a plan to let his goodness and mercy touch your life and change it. And so I'm very grateful on this Christmas Eve to tell you that we have many wonderful gifts And none of them 
are under our tree. None of them. All of the most wonderful gifts you have, none of them can be wrapped up in a box. None of them can find a place under your Christmas tree. I'm glad for all of your stuff and have fun. And especially if you've got children and grandchildren, that's going to be so wonderful tonight or tomorrow, whatever your tradition is. But the greatest gift you could ever have, the greatest gift you were ever given, is that God came to be with us. And because he came to be with us, everything good that is in my life, everything good that is in Beverly's life, it all comes from him. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. And I'm so grateful for him. And I'm so grateful for all of you being here tonight and listening to this uh, soggy crying preacher. Um, forgive me but I'm so grateful for him. And I'd like to pray for you before we go tonight. And my hope for you is that you have the most wonderful Christmas with your family. You enjoy every meal and every tradition and every moment of joy. But our world isn't joyful everywhere. Not every place is blessed like we are. But even in those places, he's still with them. And all he's waiting for is for someone to turn and tell him, you came to be with me. I want to be with you. I want your goodness and your mercy to be in my life. What a joy to celebrate Christmas Eve with you. You have honored us by coming tonight. We are so very grateful and we wish you the most wonderful Christmas. Could I pray with you? Lord Jesus, I thank you for every person every couple, every family, every single, every senior, every child that is gathered here tonight. Thank you, God, for every home that is represented, every family that is represented. And I pray for them the greatest gift would be manifest in their life, in their home, in their family, among their friends, that every one of them would know you, Emmanuel, God, with us. I pray, Jesus, that this Christmas as our world kind of seems to be a little out of control and there's a lot of turmoil and violence and fighting and war. And we sit here in peace. We're thankful for political peace, but we're much more thankful for the Prince of Peace, for you, Lord Jesus. Let your presence be felt in every home, let your blessing rest on every home and let your love permeate every moment of this Christmas celebration for these wonderful people that have honored you tonight by their presence. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Now, would you stand? And I know we did this at the beginning of service. You didn't have to pay to get in, but you got to pay to get out. You have to shake at least eight or ten hands and wish people around you a Merry Christmas. Thank you for celebrating Christmas Eve with us tonight. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful Christmas celebration.